we will get started. There's a lot to do this evening because almost as soon as the domed structure became a possibility, it dominated the Armenian architectural landscape. On the one hand, its theological implications resonated profoundly with Armenians as it created the possibility for Armenian Christians to worship within the cross, physically to worship within the three-dimensional cruciform shape of the cross, and to do so surrounded by the shapes that the ancient world considered to be the fundamental building blocks of the universe. All of those shapes being included in subtle or not so subtle ways within the church structure. On the other hand, the timing of the appearance of the domed church was perfect. The seventh century in Armenia would be one of the very most productive periods architecturally in its history. Interestingly, because by contrast, the Byzantine world is not so. Now, at first glance, as we think about the history of this period, it's a little bit counterintuitive why there would be a boom in building in the 6th and 7th centuries in Armenia. The Arshaguni kingdom had fallen. In fact, it had been gone for a century. And so Armenia, as an independent, unified political entity, didn't exist. What had been the territory of Armenia was divided between Persia, as you can see there, the Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire on the right of the screen, and the Roman slash Byzantine Empire on the west, Armenia itself did not actually exist. And as you can see, the original division of Armenia, which is shown by the red line on the left, gave the vast majority of Armenian territory into the care of the Persians, into the care of the Sasanian Empire. The second division of Armenia, Armenian territory, which took place uh, in 428, and is shown to you by the lighter red line to the right, divided it a little bit more evenly between the Byzantines and the Persians. It would be divided again in the sixth century. And here you can see the purple being the Byzantines and the kind of grayish white being the, the Persians, that there had been a new push to take over more of the Armenian territory by the Byzantines, and it was at least to some degree successful. So without a king, without even the semblance of a centralized government, we who are used to organization being essential to our life would think that Armenia would have become unproductive for lack of a coordinating focus of power. Fortunately, this was not the case. Centralized government is not a deeply rooted tradition in Armenian culture. And in this instance, the tribal or clan structure of Armenian society made productivity not only possible, but probably, and not even, not even inevitable, but it, it made sure that the period without a central government would be just extraordinarily productive. Each of the dozen or so clans that brought a kind of a loose organization to the Armenian plateau needed to have for themselves, for each one of them, not only government structures that would take care of business matters in their own region, but they also needed to have their own religious infrastructure. And so in this period without a central government, with government by clans, the building of new churches and monasteries proceeded 
very swiftly. Where there is, I don't need to tell you this, where there is a plurality of noble Armenian houses, there will also inevitably be competition. Jockeying for power, trying to have the most area under one's control in order, of course, to do the best for the place at large. But architecture was one way to express a clan's prestige, its influence, its affluence, and perhaps it was also a way to garner divine favor as well. And so the clans built churches, monasteries, and other structures. The Catholicoses of Armenia were not immune to these dynamics either. And as we're going to see, at least three of the, the seventh century's pontiffs left their indelible impression on the land in the buildings that they created. After all, the Catholicoses were tasked with providing a kind of unity of faith to this divided population. And they had to achieve this unity of faith without disturbing or antagonizing either one of the great powers that were looming on a daily basis over the lives of their faithful. And this was, as you can imagine, a gargantuan task. And it's no surprise that failure in achieving their goals was a frequent thing. Nonetheless, we are going to be looking at some of their most successful structures. Now, Dr. Christina Moranzi estimates that there are over a hundred churches dating from this century. So it's, you know, I hate to do this, but we're going to be only able to deal with about nine of them in this time that we have together. And we'll be dealing with them, I'm afraid, in a rather cursory manner. And this seems like an insult to the structures almost and to the people who built them. But it is what it is. And if you desire to pursue the matter farther, I very much recommend Dr. Moranzi's articles, as well as her volume, I think it was 2015, Vigilant Powers, which discusses at great depth three structures from this time period, Moren, Zavarnots, and Padovni. So some of those are in the, the folder of readings for this class. So before we start with our churches, our domed churches, I would like to, <laughs> to give us an illustration of how the other things that are already in place, basilicas and such, in Armenian church architecture do not simply disappear in this time period. They uh, are incorporated into the new types of structures. And we're going to begin at uh, Panzashen in Shirak, a province that was on the Persian side of the former Armenia, and that was governed by the very ancient aristocratic clan of the Kamsaragans. Hemzashen is not very far from Harichavank, and they're similar to one another. You can see where the little circle with the cross on the top of it is. That's the location we're talking about. They are both a hodgepodge of different structures that were put up in various periods. This is true, of course, of many Armenian churches, including Hobanavank, Salmosavank, which also date in their kernel from this time period, but which we will not be visiting this evening. However, at Harichavank, the oldest building, the seventh century St. George Church, or St. Gregory Church, is now hidden amongst the later structures. There are several domes there, which one belongs to the original building. You see the caveat in the front and so on. If you look at it from the top, you can see that the church, the main church is actually the last building in the complex. It's the farthest one behind. And here is a nice picture of its dodecahedral dome from the air. 
So you can kind of see that other things have been added in front and off to the sides of it. It's kind of the opposite situation when you come to Pemzashen, because there, what has what has survived, you have to walk across this little green area. And when you come to the church, the seventh century structure is not the oldest part of the complex, it's actually the newest. This site is home to two basilicas, actually, a small one, and then a larger one, which you can see the outline of here off to the side. When you look at this, you think, oh my goodness, <laughs> the situation in which this poor building finds itself. But you can also see pretty readily that the church that's still standing at Pemsoshen has a small cruciform central domed plan with a single octagonal, almost intact, drum on top of it for the dome. The dome, of course, is gone. So it looks very similar to decor. As I said, the dome that once stood above this drum has collapsed, but the geometric cornice or the rim on which the dome, the pointed part of the dome would have sat, is still pretty much intact. So you can picture in your mind what it would have looked like with the dome on top of it. And you can also see that it has as we have seen in other early churches, the four windows in the dome. You can interpret those in any way that you like. You can think of four evangelists. You can think of the four corners of the world. You can think of the four points of the compass. Mm -hmm. You can think of the four basic elements. There's also a side chapel attached to the main church with a separate entrance. So even though it looks a little odd, the main door to the church is on the left of your screen. And the door to the side chapel is on your right. And if you look above the main door, you can see the outline of some kind of sculpture. So let's move in a little closer and show you what it is. Above the entrance, the main entrance to the church, is a carving of the Virgin Mary in the center with a halo, holding the infant Jesus in her arms. And to either side of her, you can see at least the remnants of an angel each of them descending, holding a cloth across their arms. And if we come even closer, below the angels, the one on the, on the left has been very badly defaced, the one on the right is in better condition. If you look beneath the angelic figures, you can see the outline of two others each of whom seems to be bearing a gift in their hands. So entering into this space, this is what one is confronted with. The interior is informed by this sculpture over the doorway. On the other side of the structure, you can see that there are spaces where perhaps Khachkaj were intended to go, perhaps an inscription. We don't know at this point. And there are from place to place random 
carvings embedded in the walls. And you can see beneath the, the well-carved stone, there are some scratched images as well. Bear in mind the shape of that cross because we will be seeing it again on other structures from this period. The cross with the equal four equal arms inscribed within a circle and having you know, basic foliage between the arms. Mm -hmm. On the sides of the Penzashen church, we can see decorative bands, very simple decorative decorative bands at the very top, the edge of the dome, and at the edge of the building. Here's a closer view of them. And in addition, the same decorative motif is repeated as an eyebrow above the windows. The rear facade of the church and chapel, unfortunately, is practically in ruins. But you can see also that at one time there had been other rooms attached to the facade of the structure, even with the collapsed walls. Going into the church, a little bit risky thing to do, but there we are. You go into the church, you look up, and you notice that the dome, the eight faces on the dome are echoed by the eight archways on the interior surface of the dome. The number eight being significant, not so much for considerations of the church as space, but for considerations of the church as embodying time. It was felt that there were, as there were seven days of creation, so there were also seven ages of the world, and these were described in terms of different biblical uh, groupings of stories. And at the end of the seventh age, the age in which we are currently living, there would be an eighth day, an eternal day, which opened at the end of time. And so eight-sided things, in addition to being geometrically desirable and structurally desirable, also could carry this kind of significance, including within the church structure, not only the elemental forms of the universe, but a reminder that the passage of time and the end of time are not the end. And you can see the four very large squinches below those archways supporting the dome. This church is still visited. In fact, there's a guest house in Pemzashen that now uh, specializes in showing people the aspects of this church. And you can see that from random stones in the area, a kind of an altar has been reconstructed. There are also remnants of very good quality carving on the inside above doorways. So here you see a double cross, a cross within a cross, against a background of vegetation, standing over again four blocks of design. And outside the church, there are khachkars and parts of khachkars, some of them rather unusual, like this one here. Again, some unusual motifs visible here on the fragments of Khachkars. And some of them just extraordinarily beautiful. This one in particular, which has 
six roundels circling around the seventh in the middle, filled with motifs having to do with the creation. So that is our first look at a seventh century church, which incorporates the dome, but maintains other earlier aspects. Maybe at some point someone will do an elevation or a restoration of what the original churches would have looked like. Second one that I'd like to visit, another seventh century church, is named Ardavazik. It sits in a field not very far from the village of Puraka. You can see this is an old photo. It has a 13th century bell tower on top of the piece that's been added to the body of the church with its own rather strange, very elongated, kind of stork-like looking dome on the top. <clears throat> since that time, since the time that photo was taken, the the tower on the bell tower has, or the dome on the bell tower has disappeared, it's fallen in, it's collapsed. As you can see in this photo, and you can see that there's not very much of that church left. However, this is one of those monuments where it is actually done better over time. So here's what it has looked like. Now, I like this picture. I'm a sucker for nighttime pictures. It gives you a little idea of what the inside space might look like. Now this is uh, very fortunately for us on the tourism map. And so it has been cleaned up, not exactly restored, but it's in good enough condition now that people can visit it. So you can go inside, and once you're inside, you, you'll notice there's no dome whatsoever left on this, but we do know where it was. <laughs> so the, the long arm of the cross is very long by comparison with the, with the horizontal arm. So this is almost a basilica. And right next to the apse, the end of this long arm, there's the remains of one side chapel, probably a vestry. There may have been a matching one on the opposite side of the apse, but we don't have that part of the wall anymore. And you can see that the arch of this doorway is actually interrupted by the wall to the left. So the wall to the left has been added later, moved in a little bit on the encroaching on the property of that side chapel. And above this doorway too, we have a virgin and child, not an ancient one. Here's a little sketch of it. People are very fond of this depiction. So you can see Pilgrims coming to it, touching it. Again, a painting of the Virgin and Child above a seventh century lintel. The apse, which is now open air, has enough of its wall remaining to show us the location of the single window other churches may have two or three. The single window that would have been located behind and above the altar. This church sits near a, a small river. And you can see on the far side of the river, there is a very large chachka which is also frequently visited by people coming to see the church. And we're going to go look at it too in the next slide. 
I can get it to move. It's a 13th century chachka. But if you look at the cross carved on it, it stands balanced on an eternity wheel that's inscribed with a double cross, so an eight-armed double cross. And looking at it, it almost looks like a flattened version of an eight-sided dome. Now, if you turn around from this Khachkar and you look back where you came from, you have a better view of the rest of the structure of this small church. And in fact, as we're going to see in, the, in these and the next slides, one of the things that Armenians decided to do with their dome was to use it with intimate, small spaces, creating a warm atmosphere within the church, not seeking to impress the person coming into the church with the distance between God and man or with the vastness of divine power, but rather bringing God and man closer together, perhaps in a way allowing once again the infinite presence of God to be held and contained within a human-sized space. Now, I say this because we're going to take just a minute to have a look at a few things that were being built in Byzantium in the same century. They're very different. That intimate idea is not present. Instead, something else is being done with these spaces. So here's one example. This is the Cathedral of the Assumption on the island of Torcello off Venice. It's a slightly later structure, but it will illustrate what I'm talking about. So here's the cathedral itself, the Cathedral of Torcello, the Cathedral of the Assumption. But next door to the cathedral building, there's this. This cathedral was built, actually, the cathedral building in 639 by a man named Isaac, who was the ruler of Ravenna. And he was competing in his constructions and his business dealings with the rival power in mainland Venice. So here next to the basilica, there stands a domed structure, the church of St. Fosca, which is in fact a martyrium. And you can see that that dome, in addition to being rounder and flatter than what you find in the Armenian world, also covers pretty much all of the interior of that church. So you can kind of, this is a grainy photograph, I'm sorry about that, but you can see how the, the outline of the dome at the top of the picture shows you that the entire space in which you're standing is going to be covered by that dome. It's not exactly a focus point. And this is a form, you can see it here more clearly, how large the dome is compared to the body of the church. The circle that's drawn in the middle really leaves very, very little space outside it. So the cross is there. The apse end of the cross, the apse arm of the cross is a little bit longer than the others, but there really is not much space that isn't covered by that dome. This kind of very largely domed structure is typical of martyr shrines in Byzantium, including most famously a structure that we'll look at a little bit later, well, toward the end of the class, the structure above the tomb of Christ in Jerusalem in the time of Constantine, which is a complete dome. Let's also look at this Byzantine structure. This is Hagia Irene built by Constantine the Great in the fourth century, second in size only to Hagia Sophia. 
And you can see it too has a massive dome. The dome is a little bit taller than the other one, but it's a multiple window dome. This is not a four window dome or <laughs> any of the other variations that we're going to see in Armenia in this time period. This is a massive three-aisled basilica. It was destroyed by an earthquake in the early 6th century. It was restored by Justinian. It was destroyed a second time by an earthquake. It was restored again in the 8th century by the Emperor Leo. And that's presumably when it got its dome. Again, this is a dome that favors spread, extent, and a smooth surface, unlike the smaller compets in Armenia that bring things together to a point rather than spreading the dome over the entirety of the center of the structure. So it's not that there are no domes in Byzantium, it's just that they're different. Let's look at one more, the Church of St. Sergius, Sarkis and Bahus. <laughs> I picked this one because in the sixth century, it served as a refuge for Monophysite Christians from the East, i.e. from Armenia, um, who used it. Again, you see this has a very low spreading dome, but this time the dome pretty clearly has 16 faces and eight interior windows. Again, this allusion rather than to space, an allusion to time, as the whole of the physical creation is included in the geometric elements, so the whole of time is included in the windows, reminding the people below that the eighth age is going to be the one without end, and that it will begin just when we think everything is over. When we look at the floor plan of St. Sergius and Bacchus, things become more interesting for our purposes. Yes, the dome covers a great amount of the interior space, but the way that it is seated creates another cruciform space within the church, setting this circle within a square and encouraging people to navigate around it in the narrow uh, passageway, the ambulatory that goes around that center. Again, kind of putting people in the position of circumambulating the dome, even though it's far above them. So we're going to keep in mind this idea of a freestanding cross at the center of a church. As you can see, you could draw those lines in multiple ways. You could go from the from one of those conch shapes, that's what those semicircles are called, from one from the top right to the bottom left, top left to the bottom right. You could cross between the the dots. You know, there are many ways to create a cross there. So we want to keep this little phenomenon in mind. And then we want to go to the Northeast to look at a different set of details. To another place that was very much connected with the Byzantine Empire and as well had serious connections with Armenia, connections that are going to actually come apart in this time period as the Georgian church moves away from its long time fraternal alliance with the Armenian church. The Church of St. Georgi is very interesting. There it is on the left. What has happened to this structure? We don't know the exact timing of its building. But when you look at the scale of it, there's really very short arms on that building. 
it's almost square. And the scale of it is relatively very small. This is called a tree of life church, a cross church, for obvious reasons. That's all you have there is the cross. There is no containing structure around it. It's just the dome, the center of the cross, and the cross itself. The cross is fully cruciform from the outside, nothing but the cross. <laughs> and it's on a human scale, but in this case, it's very vertical. And you can see some of the, the same things that we saw at Pemzashen, the very simple adornment around the top of the building and the base of the dome. And there's a person standing there for scale. Showing you approximately how tall that church is relative to a person. Again, it's very vertical. And you think to yourself, hmm, I think maybe inside that church you could fit, what, 40 people comfortably, something like that. This is not a church for a big congregation. And it gets more interesting when we look at an Armenian church that's not too far south of it in Tavush, a place called Tsurviz, also called Morozoro, <laughs> near the little town of Nusabobi. This church also has a vertical aspect to it. And it's much smaller than the church St. Georgi. When I went to this church, about three of us fit comfortably inside it. I'm not sure where we would have put a priest. So it, it's a very limited space internally. And it is fully cruciform on the exterior. But you can see there are some differences things that we have not seen up to this point. In the 13th century, the early 13th century, this region was controlled by the Zakarian family and the Atabeg Ivane sponsored the rebuilding of the dome on this little Astvatadzin church in 1213. It was a significant building despite its size because one of the inscriptions on it is by King Georgi of Georgia, who was, for those who know her story, the father of Queen, or as she called herself, Takavor Tamar. But the basic structure of the church is much older. <clears throat> Here's the plan of it. It shows you the implicit cross outside. If you were to draw squared off walls around the outside, you would definitely have a cross. This has been softened on the inside, creating, in effect, four rounded spaces for the arms of the cross. And this elevation drawing of the church shows you how those little kind of baby conches, those little rounded spaces at the ends of the arms of the cross look from the outside. The dome is tall by comparison with the rest of the church. And it's almost as if the dome has actually sprouted organic forms around it. Here's what it looks like on the inside, looking into the apse. You can see there's just the four windows. There are small squinches holding up the dome. There's a slight peak to the archway. 
And as I said, you know, three people barely fit in this space. And outside, it has really magnificent hotchkars. The day that I visited this church, it was a very strange sight. On top of that hotchka, there was a dead rooster with beautiful plumage, and the, the tail was falling over one side of the hotchka, and there was blood down the hotchka. So it had clearly been freshly killed, this rooster. It had not been there long. So madach was being done at this church. The church is still in use. I did not bring you a picture of the Chachkar with the rooster on it. I thought it might be better not to. <laughs> so this kind of intimate dome, the little space where you and God and a couple of your friends may be able to stand and worship is something that Armenians really, really enjoy doing with their domes in this time period. Let me show you another one. This is a big favorite. Garunavor Surpastvatadzin is in Ashtarag. It's from the same seventh century. Again, in the, the central part of the country that's governed by Kamsaragans and Amadunis. Here it is. I'm sure most of you have seen it. If you haven't, do yourself a favor and go have a look. There will be little kids around there who will be more than happy to tell you all about this, this church. Ashtarag, of course, is in Aragadzodan, south of Shirak, where we just were. This little tiny church was the chapel of a small convent for women. And since it was a small convent, the very private, small scale of the church seems appropriate. And as you can see, again, there is nothing there but the cross. You just have the four short arms and the dome. And while it is a very small tree of life indeed, it does have all of the characteristics of the stepped and very stable structure that it represents, which it's tempting to see, of course, as the cross's own stability. You can see that the, the four arms of the cross that form the body of the building are echoed in four smaller arms that help to support the dome and create a second level cross from the outside. And here you have a good view of that second cross, which also creates a stepping upward feeling towards that dome. When we look at the plan, we can clearly see that the cruciform structure pertains inside as well as out. There's a slightly longer bottom leg to the cross. But the inside is an accurate reflection of what is on the outside. And when we look at it from above, we can see that this little church has adopted just a bit of the rounder quality of a Byzantine dome, while it still maintains its eight-sided structure. It's cruciform, doubly cruciform, central domed, and tiny. And I think that when the entire complex was still standing, this little church functioned like a dome for the whole complex, functioned like the nail in the middle of the cross of the other structures surrounding it. 
So Carmaravor is named for the color of its stone. And considering its age, the decorations on it are extremely fine and still very beautiful. Even the less adept, the more scratched cross on the bottom is still very beautiful. And the structure is surrounded by crosses, which seems appropriate. And on the ground, wonderful hotchkas have been raised here over time. As you can see, one of them is upside down, including these unusual ones and this, which is a magnificent example of a lacework cross, although it's been quite eroded. You can still see how gorgeous it was when it was first built. Mm -hmm. So yet another Armenian use of a dome to create an intimate, warm place where a few people gathered together can meet with the divine. If we move even farther to the west, to Tallinn, which is really on the, if you're thinking of the Armenian map as the face, it's really on the nose, sort of, of the present day Armenia, on the very far edge of Aragazun, <clears throat> in what, like Shirak, was Kamsarakan territory. We find, first of all, obviously everyone looks at this first, the great seventh century cathedral of Tallinn, which is a must see among Armenia's larger dome basilicas and is also a seventh century building. And you can see <clears throat> the kind of exquisite care that was taken with its dome. Like the smaller church with the arcades in the dome, this one has them as well, only many more of them, 12 of them. And one might be tempted to think of them in terms of the significance of 12s, the apostolic framing of the light. But just a stone's throw from this church, standing to the side very humbly in the background, is Nersay Kam Saragan, Prince Nersay Kam Saragan's church, the Holy Mother of God. All Armenian churches were named for the Holy Mother of God. We could talk about the reasoning for that at some other time. And you can see here how close it is to the big cathedral church. Built at about the same time as the larger church, there is an obvious intention to create another one of these small, intimate, domed, tree of life churches. And like the one at Garmaravur, you can see that its dome as well presents a little bit more of a rounded Byzantine-ish silhouette. And then on the interior, when you go inside, the squinches that hold up that dome, those triangular bits in the corners above the arches, are extremely pronounced. And yet, below that, the altar apse is tiny. It's hard to imagine where a deacon would stand in this kind of a space. And again, there is the one window above and behind the altar. Here's another one. Sup Stepanos Lumbatavank. It's another variation on the Armenians' intimate take on the cruciform church. This one is located near Arti, yet another one of the churches that was built in Shirak. 
it's bigger than what we saw at Tallinn or at Garmanagor. But the idea is the same. You have the very short arms, the cross on its own, with its center pointing to the sky. It's not distant from a population center at all. And in spite of the little bump out that has been put on it, it's still, again, considering its age in pretty magnificent shape, with similar decorations, eyebrows over the windows and uh, at the top of the structure underneath the dome that we've seen in the others. But we can see too that it's dome, this is a 3D model of it. I'm still trying to find a way to get these 3D models to actually move on my screen so I can have fun with them with you. Uh, I think they're great. You can see that the brickwork or the tile work on the top of this dome makes its simple eight-sided structure more complex and interesting. So I want to flip the church over, which is something that you can do in a 3D model, and I want to look at it from the bottom. So if you were looking up from underground into Sub Stefano's Lambatavan, you can see how it focuses the attention in this cruciform structure. You can clearly see the forearms. You can see how it focuses attention on that dome that covers the center of the cross and invites you to look at how many crosses are incorporated into that dome. Mm -hmm. They are practically without number. So it's creating crosses within the dome that stands above the cross. And this can be seen again in the floor plan where it's clear the entrance side of the church, what would be the bottom arm of the cross is a little bit longer than the other arms. And we would expect to see as we indeed will on the inside of the church, there has been care taken to round those arms. So when you're standing inside the church, you're surrounded not by sharp spaces, but by softer ones. Lombatavank is also very famous for the frescoes in its altar apps. As you can see, they're very damaged. And yet, if you look at the bottom left of your screen, the edge of the dome, apse, apse dome, you see a wheel quite clearly. And you see that there's a big structure of some kind in the middle. If you go out a little bit, you can see the same thing on the other side. And there seems to be a footstool in the center. And you're thinking, this is not what I normally see inside the dome of a church. And then if you come in a little closer, you can clearly make out two figures with wings. And the wings are full of eyes. And the winged creatures stand between the wheels next to that throne structure. In other words, the altar of this tiny intimate church is seen as the throne of God in Ezekiel's vision, which he relates his encounter with the divine terrifying chariot. He tells this vision in Ezekiel one, he tells it again in Ezekiel 10, and he sees the chariot for a third time much later in his book, when God is visiting him in captivity in Babylon to give him important insights. That's a very large statement to make about a space this small. 
this church, this little cruciform structure, is the actual chariot of God. Other carved motifs are also visible on this church, together with inscriptions. And this one should remind you of one that we saw earlier, the four equal arms of the cross inscribed in a circle, one of the ancient forms of the cross. Now, just in case we should begin to think that these intimate, small-scale domed churches were built only in the center of Armenia, only in Kamsparagan territory, Armenian territory. There is this one. We'll just look at it briefly. I don't have more than one picture of it. Supasvadzadzin Voskepar is at the far edge of Tavush. You can see how close it is to the border. I'm glad there's at least one picture of it. It's a little bit larger in scale than the others that we've been looking at, but the structure is the same. Four short arms make up the base cross. Four supporting arms make up the secondary cross. The eight-sided dome at the top also has on it eight blind arcades, the equivalent on the outside of having eight arches on the inside of the dome. I have no idea what's on the inside of this church. So one of the things that Armenians do with their domed cruciform churches is to make them infinite, to make them warm spaces of encounter with the divine that is immediate, that does not come through the relationship to a government, that does not form part and parcel of an imperial structure, but that rather is available to the worshiper immediately upon entering the space. Now this domed form could be scaled up as well as scaled down. And we saw in passing the Cathedral at Tallinn. That's one example of the expandable nature of it. But there was a problem with expanding it out like that. The length of the basilica form, if you just have the, the basilica and then the dome on top of it and very short arms on the side, it's not going to be stable. And as you noticed, I'm sure, on the pictures of Tallinn's cathedral, the whole dome is gone. Everything is gone. That church has, and the, the little church next to it's in fine condition. Nothing's happened to it. It's perfectly good. It's a very famous scaled up domed cruciform church is the Church of St. Kripsime. Built early, as you can see, in the seventh century. This was not a clan church. This was a Catholicosal structure. It was built by Catholicos Gomidas the first in the third year of his reign in order to replace a much smaller, almost insignificant basilica structure that you can kind of see on the back side of the church, which would be to the right of your screen. See the outline of it. That much smaller structure had housed the relics of St. Hripsime from the fourth century onward. And it was the Katoigos' devotion to St. Hripsime and his years of service as the Pagagal in her little basilica that inspired him to honor the fundamental importance of her death for the Christian future of Armenia by putting up what he considered to be a much more worthy and a much more visitable, actually, structure. This church dominates the road to Ejmiadzin. It's the first church that you encounter when you come from Yerevan to Bagar Shabbat, 
it's probably the first church also that anybody in antiquity would have encountered coming to Baal Shabbat to visit what was not the administrative center of the church, but which was the, the heart of the circuit of pilgrimage shrines that were built to commemorate the Christianization of Armenia under St. Gregory the Illuminator. St. Gregory, who often said that it was a point of special pride for Armenian Christians, that their church had been founded on the sacrifice of women saints. So if you look at this church, when you take off the bell tower, what do you see? This is a 17th century drawing of it by the famous Istanbul Armenian Yeremia Chelebi. It's your basic central dome basilica, but the issue of its potential instability has been addressed in many ways. So he wanted a larger church, but he didn't want to, uh, Katoigos Gomez did not want to have it run the risk of collapse. And so he incorporated into the structure things that would increase its stability in an earthquake prone area. For example, the very deep blind arches that you see in the center. Those are not decorative so much as they are structural. At the same time, you can see that they make a statement theologically. You have the two deep niches framing a single window. You have a two-in-one idea going on there. And then you have the three windows, if you look at them in relationship to one another. You have a Trinitarian statement. The door into this church is extremely small compared to the rest of the, the structure. So this is not an intimate, intimate church, although once you're inside, it retains that feeling. It doesn't feel as large on the inside as it does when you look at it from the outside. So in addition, Katoigos Gomidas did not make the basilica very long. He kept it almost square. And of course, there's a basement under this building, which also helps to uh, keep it stable. The supports to the dome are very equidistant, hold equal shares of the weight of that dome. They're a little larger than you would normally expect as well, making the, the interior squinches less likely to crack. And you can also see that there's a small round tower on top of the square in the secondary cross at the second level. There's also these little towers that are attached to the dome to keep it further stabilized. So this wider dome, here you can really see those towers. You can see the same ornamentation that we've seen on other much smaller churches, very simple ornamentation. And the sighting of this church at the top of a platform provided inspiration for this. St. Barton Cathedral in New York, mm -hmm. which was built as the premier statement of Armenian presence on the East Coast. You see it here when it was first built, you can see the, the blind arches. Clearly they're not large enough to have the same stabilizing quality that they do on the Bittersumay Church, but you don't really need that anymore with the structural components that we now have. Here is, it is as it is today. And even though it doesn't have the little round towers up against the dome, it doesn't really need them with all of the steel that's in this structure. Mm -hmm. You still have that stepped up progression of cross upon cross. And I think that overall, this was a wise choice of a model for a church in New York City because since the, even though the cathedral is not really in an earthquake zone, there is constant 
vibration from road traffic and subway traffic, air traffic, always affecting this church. And as a kind of reminder of this original inspiration for it, there is embedded into the facade of the complex a very nice little model of the original Nipsume church. The plan of St. Hripsime, going back to the original church, shows its multiple interior crosses that are there with a variety of shapes. You have almost fully round ones, you have semicircular ones, you have square ones. The corners are anchored with chapels, which are also cross arms. And on the inside, it's interesting to, to note that this altar apse was originally constructed with one window above it. So there would be one window on each side of the dome, so the normal kind of four windows set up that we're used to seeing in an eight-sided dome. But soon after, they added the supplementary two windows so that there are three now over each side, 12 in all. <laughs> and there was one scholar who said that this change was made in order to combat the Chalcedonian tendencies that there were at the time among many leaders of the Armenian church. The dome is also reinforced with 12 ribs, as you can see up there, that match those windows. So there would be a nice symmetry to them. They're in groups of three. A little bit different option from the 16 rib dome that we saw last week. And the ribs actually also serve to allow the material of the dome to be a little bit thinner and lighter. So there's less pressure on what's below. The Hiripsime Church is focused on its Bema, but not on the Bema per se, as much as on what is beneath the Bema. The chapel of Hiripsime's tomb. And it's almost a miraculous thing to think of Katoikos Gomidas' care in constructing this church. This church, as far as I know, has not had any ma major renovations done to it since it was built. Although new things have been added, like these beautiful carved doors. So essentially unchanged over the centuries. Hripsime was renovated in the 17th century, a thousand years after it was built, by the Katoigos Pilibos. And the historian Arakel of Tabriz tells us about this. He says that they repaired the roof, the top of the dome. They did some cleaning up of the facing on the outside walls. They put a cross on the top of the roof. And then they added a little portico on the west end of the church, the entrance end of the church, for people to not come into the church totally wet from the outside. As you've probably noticed, Hiripsime Church is completely surrounded by a rampart wall, and the western and southern gates to the church were closed thereby creating some traffic control and ensuring that pilgrims would all come in the same way. A hundred years later, 1790, the bell tower was actually put on instead of that small portico. In 1936, there was some work done to shore up the foundations a little bit. 1959, 1960, there was work done on the outside courtyard on the steps. 
On the inside, they lowered the floor a little bit. And they took off all of the plaster that had been added to the interior in the earlier restoration in order for people to be able to see clearly all of the, the squinches and other complicated pieces that act that hold up the dome in this church. Very beautiful system. And it's interesting to think of St. Hypsime and its stability in contrast with a church that was built just a little bit later by a different Katoigos, Katoigos Yezer. Saint Guyane. has an exterior portico that was added to it later. It was primarily a basilica. Mm -hmm. And that basilica was kept, not a square, with this what's called a chevette on the front of it, this little supporting wall that goes up in a peak. And it may be that the structure was kept as a kind of homage to the story that it commemorates and to an underlying structure. The church stands over the remains of a martyrium that was built by St. Gregory himself and that was repaired by St. Sahak in the fifth century. So obviously one would want to keep it. However, the larger form, the longer form of this church, unlike the shorter form of Ripsime and without its supporting structures cost this Guyana church its stability. And by the 17th century, the roof had completely collapsed, leaving just the walls and the piers of the inside columns. So it had to be renovated fully in the 17th century. And here you can see it. The dome has created the cruciform structure like one would expect. But it's a little bit out of proportion to the rest of the building. And now that it has been reconstructed, it's always beautiful. It's just a fantastic place. Here's the inside of it, what it would have looked like. Longitudinal, so it's has that straightforward orientation of a basilica. The dome is relatively small compared to the internal space. It has four freestanding piers that support that dome. So again, it's structurally a little bit weak. And the cross arms that radiate from that central bay are a little bit higher than the vaults in the rest of the church. So these little modifications make it look more cross-like from the outside. It also features Byzantine style brickwork, which you can see in the portico in particular. Mm -hmm. Typical Byzantine construction. Katoigos Yezer was very pro-Byzantine in his stance towards things theological and church political something which, uh, an orientation which has cost him a lot of popularity over the, the ages. He became, in fact, one could almost say infamous for his pro-Byzantine stance. And the door to this church is absolutely perfectly sighted. When you stand at it, you're looking directly into the window behind the altar or the light that would come around the altar if there was a picture above the altar. And above the, the, the door, you have Mary and John, Jesus. Not at the crucifixion, but enthroned. Now, in preparation for next week, we're going to look at a third thing that Armenians did with the dome. The third thing is they took the dome off the church and just put it on the ground. Mm -hmm. 
This turned out not to be the most fantastic idea in the world because these there and Zavatnots was copied. There are several other fully round churches in Armenia. None of them is still standing. Hmm. But it was a great idea. It was a lovely idea. Special case in all possible ways and another Catholicosal structure by yet a third Catholicos. I'm sure that you've been there and you know that as you're on the road from Yerevan to Shabbat, the entrance to this, what was once a masterpiece of architectural construction is very unimpressive. From the road, it looks like there's nothing there at all. What of any worth could possibly be hidden behind that really shabby gate that there is at the front? And if you go through the gate, there's a very long road that leads you down to the ruins. So it's hard to see what you might be anticipating at the end of the road. And on some tours in Armenia, a stop at Zavart Notes is advertised as the last item in the itinerary for the day before the much anticipated masterclass of making Dolma. I did see several of these kinds of itineraries. <laughs> and you can imagine how much attention hungry tourists are going to be giving these ruins and how much they're going to be thinking about them at that point in their day. And yet, this is what I saw the first time that I visited Zavat Notes in the 1990s. There's really not much. This is a, another one of those structures that has benefited from time, I have to say. Mm. On the part of the church floor that was visible in the 90s, an architect archaeologist had set up a few of the capitals that were kind of lying around in the field around it. And you could see from the quality of those capitals that this church was something impressive. Both the size, the motifs, the workmanship on those. And the people who set these out within the confines of the church wall used these capitals to outline the shape of a freestanding, four-armed, rounded conch cross in the middle of it. And looking at that, you begin to think, wait a minute, this is a round church. There is nothing above the center to this church for that interior cross to attach itself to. How is this going to work? And you can see there's an ambulatory to go around that central cross. And there were lots and lots of stones laid out outside. I don't know how people actually did this. Just the thought of moving one of these stones into position from wherever it was. It's like the world's heaviest jigsaw puzzle. And yet they were trying to put together as much as they could of what the exterior of this church might have looked like. And you can see that they have round kind of window shapes there on the ground, as well as arches. The restoration team had been trying their best to gather these things up and put them in a coherent form. So at that point, they did know what the church's internal plan looked like. So you can see there's an entranceway at the top of the screen. There are secondary entrances at the other three cardinal points. And then in the middle is that four-lobed cross with some kind of pillars in the center, but otherwise unsupported. There was not yet in the 90s the possibility of seeing the church from the air as there is now. And when you start to look at that, it becomes evident that the church is part of a much bigger complex. You can see that there are buildings around it, outlines of buildings around it, and there are probably more just under the soil. In fact, the buildings around it, and at one time the gardens and vineyards around it, 
we're part of the Catholicos, Catholicos' own complex. The Catholicos who built this structure, Nerses Ishansi, had the misfortune to reign from 641 to 661, which as you'll hear next week, was a cardinal time not to be Catholicos. <laughs> and he was a Catholicos who made many political mistakes for which he paid dearly. Now, obviously, much more of the church has now been reconstructed than was there at my original visit. So the columns have been put in place, and you can really start to see the interior emerge. Some of them are single, some of them, as you can see, at the back here, it's at the front, have had their full joining arcade added to them. So you can see what it would have looked like walking into this space and how carefully those arches are situated so that someone walking through the door would be able to see from one side of the church to the other. It's looking pretty good. And the size of these things, this is just the base of a column. It's so massive. It seems that there was a hope and intention that the sheer size of the pillars would be sufficient to support the space. We have more of a feeling now for the gracefulness of this interior, despite the massive proportions of its component parts. So part of the wall is now up. The restorers have also reconstructed one of the monumental doorways. In this picture, you can see it to the left. Here we look at it straight on. This is how it looks when you approach it now from the outside. You can see how well it lines up with the interior. And here's what it looks like when you're going out through the door, you're looking from the interior outward. And you can see references in that doorway to ancient building styles, things that much predated Ishansi's time. So he's trying to create a structure that has older an older feeling to it, while at the same time having this very airy, open feeling as well. Now, there's still plenty of work to be done, even though those interior structures have been kind of reconstructed. There's a lot left to do. You can see how much is still lying out on the ground. Maybe one day it will happen. And there is some help to be had from photos like this one. This was taken in 1905 by one of the early archeological exploration teams that worked here. So you can see that the interior structures have to cite a certain way. And then that same team also unearthed this. This is a stele from the Urartian king, Rusa II, commemorating how he brought water from a nearby river. So there's all kinds of things still at Zavarnaz. And thanks to more than 100 years of work in spurts and starts, and despite the lack of a budget and the need for caution during the years when Armenia's government was very unfriendly to the reconstructing of anything religious, it is now possible to actually map out most of the precinct around the church. So you can see that the Catholicos' palace is constructed right up against the church, making it, a, in a way, his chapel. The crypt has been reconstructed. The winery has been recovered. And yes, near this, this winery, they found some very, very large jars. 
And also some really interesting motifs from the carvings have come to light. Including Does this look familiar to anyone? It will when we get to Aquaman. Mm -hmm. The eagle with its wings wrapped around the, the column protectively. And on the left here, you may actually be seeing one of the builders, perhaps the master builder, it looks almost as though he has a verat on his head. Other human figures engaged in tasks are set within friezes of fruit and leaves, as you can see on the right. But barely the lower course of the exterior wall has been put in place. This one is not yet up. And panels of the lower part of the building have been pieced together. They're waiting for placement, maybe, once that lowest course is complete. But you have to wonder what, if anything, was above that lower story? Where are those remaining stones? There are about enough stones on the ground to reconstruct one layer. What about the rest? What was above it? Was there anything above it? Is there yet any indication of how tall the structure might have been and whether the upper part of the building matched the lower part or not? Or was it like wood or something else? In other words, there's no way yet to say definitively based on the evidence that's on the ground, literally on the ground, what the exterior of this building might have looked like. And yet there have been many people who have made reconstructions of it. I'll just show you a few of them. This is what we have right now. Here's a wooden one from the museum at Zavarnots. So somebody created it as a three-story building. Then there's this computer-generated reconstruction. Doesn't have any of the carvings, but they've tried making an elevation of it. There's this one. It's somebody very cutely superimposed on the Rubens in order to give people an idea of the possibilities, although it's a bit out of proportion. There's no way those things are going to add up. Gives the church a traditional Armenian pointed dome as we know it today. <laughs> so what has made it possible for people to think, oh, well, it must have looked like this. Why would people reconstruct it in this manner? It's not just their imagination. <laughs> to answer that question, we're going to go here. Obviously not in Armenia. This is 13th century Paris, where the newly constructed church of Sainte-Chapelle was the private jewel of the Ile de la Cité, the royal precinct of France's governing dynasty, built by Louis the Ninth, known to us as St. Louis. He built it to house his collection of relics from the Passion of Christ. With pride of place given to his relic of the crown of thorns. The reliquary was later moved to Notre Dame. It survived the fire in 2019, rather amazingly. But he also had relics of the sponge, and he had relics of the lance from the crucifixion. Now, any Armenian hearing that will go, what do you mean? <laughs> How did this work? Anyway, as you approach this magnificent structure, the eye is drawn upward to the second entrance. You can see it on a balcony there the main way into the chapel. This is one of those buildings that doesn't just draw your eye upward, it actually almost jerks your head upward. There's no looking down at your feet when you're standing in front of this. And the eye can row four hours over 
just the sculptured tympanum over the door. And as you notice more and more and more detail in it, and you marvel at the kind of technique that produced these carvings. And you see the enthroned Christ presiding over the last judgment, the weighing of souls. This is what you're supposed to think of as you're entering the church. Saints and prophets, kind of head to, head to feet in the triple archway of heaven above the scene. And eventually, your, at this point, oversated eye moves downward to where the imagery is a little less dense, and your eye comes to focus on that single statue of the risen Christ, his hand uplifted in blessing toward everyone who enters the sacred space. But almost immediately, as you're looking at Christ, your eye just goes to what's behind Christ. It goes to the heavenly paradise of riotous color and extraordinary complex beauty that is within. The scale of this Sainte Chapelle, even though it's called a chapel, like that of the Byzantine imperial structures that we looked at a few weeks ago, is definitely designed to dwarf the human and to emphasize the overwhelming scale and glory of the divine. All of this to kind of say that very few people coming into this doorway even notice that below that statue of the risen Christ, there are more carvings. These carvings on the bottom of the structure depict the creation of the world on the left-hand side. Here you can see God with the animals. Then on the central pillar, there are foretellings of Christ's coming. And on the right-hand side, there are scenes from life as it unfolded outside the Garden of Eden, post-lapsarian life. And those five bottom panels are, yeah, it's, you can't see the one on the far left, but the other ones you can. You can see Adam and Eve working, sweating, laboring outside the garden. And then on the top, from right to left, we have the story of Noah, or left to right, actually. We have the story of Noah. He's shown building the ark, gathering the animals, getting ready to land the ark, building the altar to sacrifice to God, and getting drunk on the new wine. And as we go closer, lo and behold, the structure that forms the central residential part of the ark looks an awful lot like those reconstructions of Zavad notes. As revealed in part in those excavations and restorations. So the artist who one thinks must have been an Armenian working for the royal establishment in Paris, has chosen to make, literally, to make the ark the church. Mm -hmm. To make the church the ark. And Noah reaches out from the church to receive the returning dove, bearing her olive branch and signifying the end of the calamity, the receding of the waters, which you can still see roiling beneath the ark. So Mark Notes was destroyed in the middle of the 10th century, around 930. So the question automatically arises, how did the artist know what it had looked like? On what basis? 
did he make this reconstruction? And I do wonder whether there was some other intervening depiction of the Ark on which both the earlier cathedral and the later carving may have been based, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Meanwhile, there's also this imaginative reconstruction of Zavod notes. Here, the dome is not pointed, it's tiled, it's a Byzantine style dome, slightly onion shaped. And the artist, who seems not to have been aware of or not to have been influenced by Saint Chapelle, may have favored this kind of a reconstruction because he knew Catholicos Nerses III's very large attraction to things Byzantine. The Catholicos was unfortunate enough to reign at the moment when the Islamic conquest had just surged up out of the Arabian Peninsula and overwhelmed the Persian Empire, destabilizing this region that had been, for more than a millennium, pretty finely balanced between the Persian and the Byzantine spheres of influence. The wave of Islam also overran Armenia, and it did so very swiftly. It was like a tsunami in political terms, and it left Armenian nobles and Armenian hierarchs, including the Katoigos, scrambling to decide in haste whether they were going to side with the upstart power that might recede like the tide. It might be gone any second. Should they align with it in order to minimize present damage and maybe curry favor with the new government in the area for as long as it was there? Or should they throw their weight, put their trust in the Byzantine forces, now the only remaining superpower in the region now that Persia was gone? This was a quandary that Nerses Katoigos faced, and no one could foresee that Islam was there to stay. For the, at least the next 400 years, they would rule Armenia directly. And then after a very brief interlude that we call the Bagradid Kingdom, or the Bagradid and Arthurid Kingdom, they would resume ruling Armenia for a further 800 years as Arab slash Muslim dominance morphed into Turkish Muslim dominance. What was a Catholicos to do in this situation? As a Christian, head of a Christian church, his natural sympathies were with the Christian government next door, but this was very awkward because the Byzantine authorities made the acceptance of the Council of Chalcedon the ultimate litmus test of their relationship with other Christians, including Armenians. And we know that he walked a very fine political line with the Byzantines because we have historical records of his attempts to placate them and to involve them in what was going on in Armenia, a policy that eventually cost him very dearly. He even accepted the Council of Chalcedon, but didn't accept it at the same time. You can imagine that's a risky policy. Accepting it because he felt he had to, and perhaps because he also didn't see that it was that important. And on the other hand, trying to prevent the Armenian church from being fully sucked into the Byzantine church at that point. Trying not to slam the door on a relationship with Byzantium while not having the Armenians completely overwhelmed by the relationship. Katholikos Nerses spent time in Byzantine detention, far away from Bavar Shabbat, far away from his favorite building project, because the Byzantines did, in the end, view him as untrustworthy. And when Nerses finally returned to his post, having by his policies caused the deaths of numerous people. He faced a very serious reality check regarding his desire to remain within the Byzantine sphere of friendship. 
Now with Muslims on the ground and Byzantines nowhere to be found, and when they were to be found, they were very demanding and not very helpful, the Catholicos' building plan amounted to genius. What he built had at least a passing similarity to this structure, to the rotunda, the Anastasis, the resurrection church in Jerusalem built by Constantine. It also had a passing similarity to the Dome of the Rock, completed just 40 years later than Zavod notes, but already underway in his time. These similarities could cause a warm feeling of familiarity for both Byzantines who saw the church and Muslims. But Narcissus was not just making a conciliatory shrine. He chose to site his church on the spot where, according to tradition, you can see the event pictured in this altar curtain from Jerusalem, where King Tudat came to meet St. Gregory on his return from Caesarea as the newly consecrated Bishop of Armenia. And at that moment, the church completed the story of Armenia's unique Christianization. A story that was already told for the most part in the structures of Echmianzi and Hripsime and Gayane. And so it was that Nersas Katolgos chose to seat himself on the spot of that vision where the secular and religious power met in collaboration. But he didn't name his church St. Gregory. He didn't name his church for the vision. He didn't call it Joagat. He named it Savatnots, a name that was unique at the time. In other words, he named it the Church of the Joyful Watchers, the Church of the Angels. He's referencing Gregory's vision, where angels accompanied Christ on his descent to earth to strike that flat area where he wanted his center of the new Armenian Christian church to be located, an event at which the angels watched joyfully and protectively. The words of Otnotes is also applied to the angels occasionally in their military role. And no doubt the Catholicos remembered other occasions at which the angels had watched joyfully at the resurrection, for example, and in the Islamic tradition, at the ascent of Muhammad to heaven from the site of the Dome of the Rock. Again, the associations are not going to be offensive either to Christians or to Muslims, but he also made his structure clearly Armenian so that those who saw it from an Armenian perspective would understand his intentions. He very intentionally incorporated a pun into the name because the Zavartunk are vigilant. And the name, the meaning of Gregory's name is vigilant. It is indeed the church of St. Gregory but it's not overtly called that. Similar to, but different from the other structures. And the Catholicos did not stop his punning there either. When one stands at Zavod notes on a clear day, its sighting becomes strikingly clear. It stands under the overshadowing wings of Mount Ararat's twin peaks, from which we are told Turdat brought the stones for the first Armenian churches. The joyful, vigilant ones are not only disembodied angels. The joyful, vigilant ones 
are the mountains from which Armenia quarried its first Christian structures. And as Katoigos Nerses stood here, surrounded by that architecture and looking at that view from within his round church, if it is similar to what was depicted on Saint Chapelle, I'm sure that at least at certain moments, he had the joy himself of feeling like a vigilant watcher standing in the ark itself, like Noah, as Armenia floated above the floodwaters of Islam, waiting for the return of that dove that might one day signal the receding of the calamity that had overrun his land. So what do you do with the dome? You make it intimate. You can expand it. You can simply take it and set it on the ground. So next week we will, as Dr. Shahinian already mentioned, be looking at the rising tide of water <laughs> around this Armenian Ark. We'll be looking at, with her guidance, you'll be looking at the historical and theological and architectural influences that Islam would begin to exert on Armenia in this time period.